What's up, rockers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page and follow us on iTunes and Spotify. I'm Metal Dave, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And uh, man, I'm starting to feel like I'm saying this every episode, but it's a good problem to have. Who do we have today, Dave? We've got a gr- another great one. Uh, today we have rock and roll drummer Tommy Price, rock and roll Hall of Famer. I'm going to uh, interrupt you. So I learned a lot uh, about Tommy Price yeah um, in a quick moment um and i'm just gonna like jump in here real quick before you do and say because i've learned a lot uh about tommy price i mean i can't believe what this guy has done yeah from from working with uh you know sylvain from the dolls to uh roger daltrey of the who yeah so there's so much in between. Who knew Blue Oyster Cult? You yeah. Know, when they when when people watch this episode, they're gonna be like, "What?" So if you don't know who Tommy Price is, just just do a little research on your own, and you'll understand why uh, we're excited to have him today. Yeah, I mean, for me as a kid growing up, I grew up on MTV, and Tommy was all over the early years of MTV as the drummer for Scandal. Uh, he went on to Billy Idol's band. He played on the Rebel Yell album, which is a classic, all-time pause great again. album. Pause again. Dude, so that means young Metal Dave is sitting in front of the TV, probably this close to the TV, headbanging. Yeah. Uh, and, like, you know, a Scandal video would come on, and then, you know, a Billy Idol video would come on, and, and you probably, at the time, you're not really, unfortunately, looking at the drummer, same drummer same Two drummer bands yeah. same drummer videos being played back to back on mtv yeah. in the early 80s and then a few years later he's uh on mtv with joan jett so uh, um, an amazing career scandal uh billy idol joan jett played on some classic albums played on some classic songs he and his music are part of my teenage fabric that i grew up on watching on mtv so uh, the fact that he's joining us that's your shirt and he wor- he's worked with cheetah he's all he's yeah he's cheetah chrome shirt and he's yeah so yeah his his resume is outstanding michael monroe uh yeah we're going to talk about all of that stuff today it just goes on and on i mean we could have probably talked yeah. for 3 hours with him but uh let's hear it from him ladies and gentlemen tommy price <laughs> And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tommy Price, rock and roll drummer extraordinaire. Thank you for joining us, Tommy. How are you? I'm great, guys. How are you? I'm doing uh, well. Thanks so much. Uh, this yeah. is a this is a real treat for me. I mean, you you've played on some of the biggest hits of my childhood, and uh, you were certainly all over the uh, early years of MTV when I was glued to the television, uh, much to my parents' dismay. <laughs> But yeah, you, you, you and your music were a big part of my growing up. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. So uh, first of all, am I correct in understanding that you now live in San Antonio, Texas? I do. Yep. So Next when month that... actually be a year that I'm here already. Yeah. Wow. wow a year. So yeah. I'm originally from San Antonio. That I was born and raised there. So I, um, I'm an honorary member. Yeah, Jason. <laughs> Jason's an honorary member of every city in Texas. I, I live in. I live. Well, I, I thank you, Dave. I live in North <laughs> San Antonio, pretty much. Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 very, very north. So, what yeah. brought you to San Antonio, Tommy? <laughs> well, um, my wife. She's from here originally. This is where I met her. Um, in fact, she knows you. Really? Uh, she said she does. Yep. What's your wife's um, name? If you don't Stephanie. Mind. Stephanie. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I know okay. Stephanie. You do? Jason. Jason. Yeah. You know? Yeah. She said yeah. she knows both you guys. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we're practically um, family then. Stephanie Laddick. Yeah. Is, yeah. I mean, that's, that's her maiden name. Um, but I originally met her here like 25 years ago. And um, we always kept in touch whenever I came through uh, to anywhere in Texas. You know, we'd we'd go out and we'd uh, 
you know, spent a whole lot of time together. We dated for a while back then. Uh, and um, we always kept in touch. And she moved to New York about 15 years ago, actually Connecticut. Um, and then we started hooking up again while while she was there. She she moved to Connecticut for about a week and then moved right into into my apartment in New York City the next following week. That's how it works. That's how <laughs> yeah. it works. I I uh, I didn't have to go very as far as you did, but I married a San Antonio girl as well. So. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Wow. That's wrong with the Texas women. I no, I always said how, it. That's know. how it's supposed to work. I think. So. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, I, I never had a bad time in Texas. Never. Well, 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 welcome to not only visiting, but now living. And yeah. now you're not a tourist anymore. Not anymore. Yeah, That's no, right. Honorary Texan. Good. Well, yeah. well, welcome to the Lone Star State. We're glad to have you. I was surprised to learn that you live in San Antonio. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, so let's, I want to touch on your career. Uh, Cause I mean, it's a very, uh, colorful career, very storied. You've done so much in your time in the business. Um, uh, Scandal, Billy Idol, Joan Jett, and a bunch of others that people may not be aware of. And I do want to touch on those, but let, let's just go back to Scandal. Let's start from the beginning. Um, how did you end up in that band? And, and, and what do you remember about that early time frame when the band was, you know, generating hits and you were on the radio and you were big stars on MTV? That, how old were you at that time and, and what was that like for you? Um, I joined Scandal and let's see, it's probably like around 1982, uh, 1980, late 81, 82. Uh, the, the bass player, Ivan Elias, uh, him and I did some early records with uh, this woman named Helen Schneider in Germany and um, toured a lot together. Um, and uh and worked a lot together and once he got into scandal he did a lot of stuff with them i think that their first drummer was frankie laraca who was also a friend of mine from staten island um he left he did the first record the goodbye to you record um and then left the band i think he went with played with john Waite, maybe david johansson i don't know where he went but ivan called me once there was a spot open and they already had Good Bar to You going pretty good. Um, it was getting a lot of airplay. Uh, they, I think they were probably one of the first MTV bands. They did that little video in, a, in a, someone's basement. It was like a, a little put together video, but MTV picked it up and, nev and, and never stopped playing it. They played it to death. It's and that was one of the first videos the, on that show. Catchy, it's still one of the catchiest yeah. songs, I think, yeah. being introduced. Yeah. Uh, uh, but um, MTV we went using it as a vehicle. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. It sure, it sure, it sure was a vehicle because it put us on the road and kept us on the road for about a year and a half. Um, I mean, we bounced around from every tour, from the Kinks to uh, John Waite, uh, not John Waite, to, uh, from the Kinks to uh, John Mellencamp to Hall and Oates to Adam and wow. the Ants. I mean, wow. we were out non-stop with that That's record le legendary oh. legendary names you're sharing uh fanfare yeah. with and stages and, and yeah so how old are yeah, you yeah we time? we supported every one of them bands for for the you know that record was doing the good bar to you record was doing so good that they didn't want us to come home they kept they kept us on the road so we'd bounce from one tour to the next and never came home i mean you know, these days you, you go out and you tour and you're away for maybe two weeks. You come home, you know, you go back out for a couple of more weeks. You come home back then. You stayed on the road for a year, two yeah. years. You never came home. You wow. if your record was getting airplay, man, you milked it. You stayed out. Your record company, uh, you know, kept you on the road constantly touring and um I was so, out for a year on the first Toys record, and, yeah. and they and they pulled me. They pulled us off the road after about eleven months, and they said your window of opportunity. You know that contract says you you, you got to make another record, and it's like, yeah. Well, are we selling units? Yeah. Are are we? Are, we're doing good, and yeah. No, you guys are doing great. And I'm like, why can't we stay on the road? We yeah. wanted to milk the shit out of it, and it was important to us, but. It we didn't win that battle. 
So well, I mean, you you said it. Uh, you you know, you said it. That they wanted new product. Yeah. So they wanted you guys back in making more, making a new record. And that's pretty much the same thing that happened with Scandal. You know, while we were on the road, the guys were writing. We were all writing new songs and rehearsing them. So by the time we came off the road, like 16 months later, we had a whole brand new record, like in the bag, waiting to record. And they wow. put us right into the studio. You know, I think we had a couple of weeks off. We went, we were probably had a little vacation a couple of weeks or so and went straight into Ele to electric lady to start doing the warrior oh, album legendary yeah yeah and the, and the warrior album was a huge success as well so it probably kept yeah. you out even even longer after that that record hit the shelves right well it, 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 it was that record that i left the band and went with billy idol right so i didn't do the warrior tour Oh, because I had already uh, hooked up with Billy and was working on Rebel Yell. And um, so I already made a tran transition from Scandal to Billy Idol and never did the Warrior Tour. Okay. so Well, so I'm going to raise my hand right here and interrupt everybody and go, that was probably a wise choice. You can tell us yeah. if it was an honor or it was. Well, it, yeah, it was it was it was both. It was, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was a musical move that I needed to do and and a business move. And um, and it all worked out. And I would do it again in a second. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd make the same exact move um, right today, right right now, because yeah. musically it, it moved me. And um, uh, to this day, uh, you know, I still see money from those records. So, yes. Well, Rebel, you know. Yell, Rebel Yell, whether you got writing credits or, or not on that, did you? Not writing credits, but okay. I have I have I have um, I share in the in the in the in the record sales. Yeah. 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 Your performance and mechanicals. Right. So listen. Well, that. no, I mean, they offered me a piece of the record for me to leave oh. Scandal. That's the oh, whole. Wow. The only reason why I you know, one of the when I say business move, Billy wanted me in his band so bad that he was willing to give me a piece of his record. He gave you points wow. on the record. Wow. Yeah. All right. That's big. That's, that's big. even a better. Uh, yeah. yeah. No one, no one, no one fucking does that. No, yeah, does that, no. You know? exactly. Those are done in production deals. Usually the, uh, the producer will ask for that. Okay. Well, the budget's okay. How about you give me a bunch of points on the record? So that, that happens sometimes, but not with band, you know, not just a hire and fire. No, it's exactly. A, I mean, right. and I didn't really know them guys too good. I mean, wow. I met them. In the studio, I met Steve and Billy and Keith Forsey at Electric Lady. I I was doing recording both records at the same time. When they when they found me, I was recording the Warrior album downstairs in Studio A. Billy was upstairs in Studio C doing Rebel Yell <laughs> and didn't have a drummer. And uh, they were they were going through a few drummers. I don't know why right. we're laughing, but it's like talk about I, 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 cornering I, I, the market. So. I, I I just have visions of uh, of Tommy telling, uh, "Excuse me, Patty, I got to step out for lunch." And then he goes <laughs> upstairs. That well, He's down a few he running up the stairs, <laughs> running down the stairs, running up. one more song. Oh, one more song. Was, well, you know, that's, like, that's uh, what would happen. I would I would I would I had both assistant engineers on the phone all day long saying, "Okay, he's in between takes of this song." They're going to take a break. And I'd run upstairs and work with Billy for a couple of hours, come and do the same thing all day long, you know, for about a couple wow. of months. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That, well, you jumped ahead that you answered the question of how you transitioned uh, from Scandal to Billy Idol. And I wasn't expecting that. Wow. Bumped, literally yeah. bumped into each other in the hallway and. And a deal so, was born. So I want to. Well, Steve, uh, Steve was listening at the door. They were they were uh -huh. having a problem with drummers um, not being satisfied or whatever. You know, no one was was really, you know, I guess, you know, doing what they wanted them to do. Yeah. Um, and they heard they came downstairs and they just happened to listen from the from outside, from the from the foyer of, of, of Studio A and ask the engineer who's playing drums in Studio A. And they said, well, it's, you know, the scandal and it's Tommy Price. 
And Steve, and that's when they figured out, you know, once I came out, they started talking to me and that's how we, we met. Uh, wow. That's well, a listen, great story. Listen, I, I, I'm trying to, uh, uh, let me hold the conch for a second. So, <laughs> so <laughs> get the reference. So listen, like Rebel Yell is probably on about a thousand radio stations right now. And it yeah. will be on a thousand stations in about two hours. Yeah. And a thousand more <laughs> stations in the morning. It's also covered by every, almost every band I know of. I've covered that song. Uh, uh, you know, I'm on a record where there's another group of people covering, you know, that came out during COVID, that Ellison thing. Their co Ellison's band is covering that. I'm in bands with people who have side projects that are cover bands of they wedding bands and shit. They it it's a money making song. It's everyone yeah. loves the song. It's a hard rock song, it's a pop song, it's a punk rock song, it's almost a heavy metal song. I really think that there is so much texture to what Billy Idol has done to yeah. rock and roll. I mean, I, I, I was without a face. I don't even know what kind of fucking song that is, but yeah. it's got yeah. that kind of punk rock break break in the middle of it. And yeah. I'm going, what? I'm going, what? So, uh, you know, the fact that you, you were, you know, that you were in the in the soup at all is hats off. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's right a, time, it's right place, right time. Electric Ladyland, yeah. ooh yeah, yeah, yeah. Classic yeah, yeah. album, classic album. And, you know, Rebel Yell gets a lot of the attention. But as Jason mentioned, Eyes Without a Face, Flesh for Fantasy, Catch My Fall. I mean, that Huge. record is just yeah. chock full of, uh, Huge. of classic. It is. Yeah, that was the point, right? Yeah. It's pretty timeless, too. It's, it's, it doesn't sound like, you know, there's so many records that were made in the 80s that, you know, you kind of cringe when you listen to them because they sound like the 80s, you know. Yeah. Um, not that record. That record is, 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 is still sounds amazing today as it did back then. It doesn't sound time. It's timeless. It doesn't sound dated. It, the sounds on it are spectacular. The, yeah, you know, I'm, the guitar sounds, mm -hmm. Billy's vocals, it, the whole performance. It's just one of them special records. You know, I'm not I'm yeah. not throwing scandal under the bus here by any means but i think that a good example right away while we're while we're sort of sort of like timelining your your yeah you know, where you where you were at the time yeah it's like the way scandal you know the sound of the band that scandal had is very a little, yeah, a little, very a little very a, very yeah, a little yeah. dated compared to what you're talking Absolutely. about on uh right. billy's sound and and what yeah. steve does on guitar yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and Billy's Billy's thing, and uh, you know his look and his whole the package, yeah, the package yeah. that you have between Billy and Steve, yeah. that alone, I mean, you will agree is like a bang bang, and it is. scandal yeah. doesn't have the bang bang. So no, between yeah. what's going on there, that's what I feel like makes it timeless. O on top of the production as well, who produced Rebel Yell? That's Keith Forsey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a it's a classic album. Uh, it's something that any any musician would be proud to have their name on. And uh, so and it was so, you know, I was telling my wife we were talking about Billy Idol and specifically Rebel Yell. And we were watching the video the other night. And I was recalling when that was a brand new video and I'm watching it on MTV. And and Billy Idol really sort of embodied the definition of punk rock for mainstream America. Like most people didn't know what a punk rocker looked like. No. Or you never actually saw one in the they street. They thought the stray cats were punk rock just because yeah. of the, <laughs> just because of the leather jackets and the snarls yeah. and yeah. the, you know, and now, and they now didn't you know, and now, now they you see do. people that look like Billy Idol and they're teaching high school and stuff like that. But so That's my, right. my question is, was there a time with MTV, especially where where the look was an uphill battle or or did they actually embrace it because it was you guys looked so different than a lot of the stuff that was that was going on at the time especially in america american audiences had not been exposed to punk rock until you know billy idol with his bleach blonde spiked hair is on your television in the living room and all of a sudden wow this is what punk rock is about 
Well, and they look yeah. behind him, and there's Generation X, and they're going to find out what punk rock is from that. They may, yeah, but America didn't know anything about Generation no, X. You're, That's you're exactly right. right. But they did, and it was a great. It was a gateway. Billy was a gateway drug. Definitely, <laughs> he was. He was. I think he opened up a lot of doors for later on for like you know like the Clash and the Ramones. Even though them bands were huge in England, and they 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 inspired. Generation X and and the Sex yes. Pistols. The Ramones were were the beginning of everything. Let's yes. face it. But they, yeah. they they were always still underground. No one really, you know. You go to New York City and see them all the time. Um, and, you know, Max is Kansas City. They they were very underground uh, in the states. They you know they can go to Europe and be big, big giant stars there, but you couldn't see them on MTV. Billy, on the other hand, was the MTV punk rock star exactly. you know, and yeah. made it made it easy for other bands that looked like that to get on MTV. And in them days, it was a fat. It was amazing that we had that. Um, we had MTV. We had that that we were able to to have videos and and see bands what they looked like and how they dressed and and that's all kid, kids grew up on MTV and it was really important to have videos in the 80s i mean it helped your song it it, it was played if it was a cool song it was played once an hour you know they had a rotation just like a radio thing um once an hour so you'd see the same video once an hour or sometimes twice an hour. Um, but it was really important uh, to have MTV in them days. And once you saw Billy, when you saw Dancing With Myself, and he he used um, the guy, who the director that, that, that did Night of the Living Dead, have direct his video uh, for God, Toby Hooper. The, uh, the, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he had he had Toby Hooper direct Dancing with Myself, and you saw zombies in that video. You saw a billion getting electrocuted in that video. It was fucking amazing that thing. Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing Dancing with Myself way before I joined up with Billy, and I thought it was the best thing I ever saw in my life. It was a movie, but it was a video, but it was a rock song. Yeah, and it was so freaking cool. Uh, who'd, who'd have known, you know, a year after that, I, I, I'd be playing with them and uh, I'd be on MTV too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, so, so um, you're, you're with Billy Idol, you do the Rebel Yell album and, and Billy, I, I've read his book and it, it's, it's no secret that he, he, he had a period of, of his life where he was kind of a wild man. So you, do you have any crazy stories of Billy Idol stories? What's the craziest thing you've ever seen him do off stage? <laughs> well, there's a famous one of him I was somewhere in Cleveland uh, going outside. It was a bunch of kids outside his balcony. Um, he was up maybe three stories up and he came out on his balcony to say hello, but he forgot to put clothes on. <laughs> yeah, they all nice. took pictures. And of course, the next day it was in like the daily one of their daily papers, you know, <laughs> he used to do stuff like that all the time, you know. Uh, do you think he really forgot to put clothes on? Or do you think? Of course not. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was whoops, laundry I'm day. Sorry. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, yeah. It was laundry day. He didn't have anything yeah. to wear. I'm not his, putting his, on that stupid His stable, fell off while he was walking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me just fell off. Yeah. So I, I'm going to I want to ask you, I want to segue from from Billy Idol to Joan Jett. And I'm just I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, are we going to find out that you were recording with Billy and Joan just walked down the hall? And that's how you got the Joan Jett gig or how did you get? No, this gig? no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I Joan actually, Jett, yeah. yeah, well, I knew I knew Joan and Kenny years earlier. I was good friends with Kenny Laguna, her partner, her writing partner, producer. Yeah. Um, and manager Kenny Lagoon is a good friend of mine, and um, he used to share an office on 55th Street with Lieber Krebs. They were a big uh -huh. management company that yeah. managed yeah. Aerosmith and Ted Nugent, and, and so Kenny had an office up there. Um, 
that he ran out, that he worked out of. Um, and um, there was a, when I was there, like 16 years old, there was a kid in Staten Island. I was, I was playing drums on his demo and he got signed to Lieber Krebs as a young songwriter. And Ken, they sent Kenny out. Kenny did them a favor, uh, Lieber Krebs, and went to Staten Island to produce this kid's record or demo. And um, so that's how I met him. I was 16 years old and working on a demo that Kenny, Kenny Laguna was producing. So fast forward a couple of years later, Kenny starts managing. Uh, the, the Runaways had broken up. Joan hooked up with Kenny around 1980. 81, something like that. Kenny manages her and starts putting the black hearts together. Calls me, uh, you know, because he they would look, they needed a drummer. But at the time, I had just taken a Mink DeVille. I was playing with this band called Mink DeVille. Yeah. And for me at the time, I was about 21 years old. Um, and Mink DeVille was going to Europe. And for me, you know, I had never been off Staten Island before. Yeah. Uh, so it was a big deal for me. It was playing in a cool band. I love that music. It was kind of like old school, you know, blue eyed soul, rock and roll, uh, blues. And I, and I dug it. So I already had taken the Mink DeVille tour to go to Europe. So I couldn't join the Black Hearts. So, um, yeah. And every year after that, then they hired Lee Crystal of Black Hearts and, and, and he did a great job. He made their, their first few records. I think, uh, you know, Bad Reputation, a couple other records. Um, and so I went to a couple of different bands and, you know, after Billy and uh, after Scandal and um, a couple of years later, Kenny called me again. He said, uh, you know, we're Lee's you know, uh, leaving the band, we, you, you know, come in the studio. I think Joan was just doing the movie with, with, um, with, uh, with Michael J. Fox, the yeah. light of day movie. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, they were made, they were doing the soundtrack for the light of day movie. And I, I had just come off the road with Billy. Um, and I was sort of in between tours with him so I went out to L.A. and did the Light of Day record, but hadn't really joined up with her yet. I was still working with Billy. I think we did Whiplash Smile after that. And um, I did a, a uh, Australian uh, tour with them, with Billy. And then about 1987, that's when I hooked up with Joan and started touring and then stayed in that band after that for the next 35 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so that I, uh, I got a great Kenny Laguna story, by the way, quickly. So did quickly. everyone. <laughs> yeah, we were, uh, it was the, it was the day I met you, uh, Tommy, it was at Stubbs. It was, uh, the, the bill was Joan Jett, Eagles of Death Metal and the Riverboat Gamblers. Yes. And I was outside, uh, the venue on the sidewalk and, uh, Kenny was walking by and I'm with my wife. And uh, about a year or two before, I was a I was a journalist. I wrote for the San Antonio Express News for a number of years. And Joan was scheduled to play a gig at SeaWorld in San Antonio, and I was going to interview her for the newspaper. And for whatever reason, either the gig got canceled or she had to bail out on the interview or whatever, but the interview didn't happen. And Kenny emailed me and was very apologetic. So fast forward a couple years, I'm at this gig. In, at Stubbs in Austin and I see him on the sidewalk and I walk up to him and I say, Hey, Kenny, Dave Glessner here. Uh, we, we talked a couple years ago. I was supposed to interview Joan and he goes, Oh yeah, I remember. I remember. I said, he said, I'm so sorry we had to bail on you. And I was like, no, nah, it's all good. I just wanted to say hello. Cause I saw you walking down the sidewalk. He says, give me your phone number. I'll go back to the dressing room. I'm sure Joan would want to say hello to you. And I said, okay, I gave him my phone number and I'm thinking he walked away and I'm thinking he's just trying to get rid of me. Right. And meanwhile, my <laughs> meanwhile, my wife says, only you would recognize a band's manager <laughs> in, a, in a crowd full of people. You know, and I say, yes, that's the dork I am. So he goes, that's, that's that's another reason. This is this is my this is where I come in and say, this is another reason why we have a podcast. 
Yeah, uh, it's where it's a nerdy nerd, story like this. Nerd val valid, yeah, validation here. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Kenny goes back to the dressing room. Uh, text sends me a text. Tells me to come on through. He'll wait for me at the door. He'll meet me and walk me back. And so me and my wife and and a friend that was tagging along. Uh, got to go back to Joan's dressing room and say hello and take a nice. few pictures. She was, she was, a, she was just a sweetheart. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about her and her personality because I've interviewed her a couple of times and she seems like, and you've been employed by her now, as you said, for 30 some years or whatever. So That's right. she seems like she, she, she seems like she's very, runs a pretty tight ship, like very, very professional, healthy, um, driven, um, what's it like working with her? I tell you, man. And, um, she is very, very business. Just like you said, I mean, everything is, is pretty much, you know, um, it's gotta be done her way. And if it's not, she'll make you uh, aware of it, you know, not that she'll kick your ass or yell at you, but you know, uh, she won't be happy, too happy with you. Um, but uh, yeah, there's like, uh, for instance, there's no alcohol backstage, you know, um, she keeps, she, like you said, she runs a tight ship, um, you know, uh, I guess maybe whatever, whatever we did in the 80s kind of ruined it for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little too much fun, a little yeah. bit too much fun back then. <laughs> And so things got a little out of hand and and she had to put a foot down. And, so, you know, every band goes through these things where you got to after a while, you got to grow up and stop that. Stop acting like idiots and and just do your job. And um, and I, and for a long time, that's the way it's been. But everything is very, very um is 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 predictable with her with her you know um you know we do everything is by the book and very very predictable you know we do sound check we leave at a certain time we can't be late in the lobby we you know everything is very very tight and 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 and, and you know buttoned up and and uh you know it, it, that's just the way it is and that's the way it should be uh, yeah, it's a I business. Agree. It's I a agree. business, and it's got to be run like a business. So, yeah. Well, there's a reason she's been around as long as she has, and and yeah. and apparently uh, you're doing a great job because you've been with her for three decades or more than that. You know, so whatever the chemistry is between you and her, it's obviously working for you guys to be partners for this num this many years. Well, I you know I just love I love the way her band between you know between her and her band I love the way they make records. Because it's just four people, five people in the studio live playing at the same time. And uh, it's it's like the old days. It's We make every record. Every record we do is like that. Uh, and it's fun. It, that's the way bands should be doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it just, it, it comes off like that. It, everything we record, whether it's a cover song or whatever, it sounds like us. It's, you know, because it's the four of us, the same four people in there playing. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and it's just brilliant. I, I love I love the way that's the way she wants to work. And she encourages is uh, she encourages us to do it. Yeah. She, she doesn't know she's very old school. And she doesn't like change. She doesn't like any change, you know, even with the new, anything new, digital, you know, you know, doing stuff, uh, you know, uh, sending transfer files and all that. She hates that shit. You know, yeah. she'd rather be in there doing it live, seeing your face, seeing me, you know, whatever, you know, sweat. Right. Yeah. That's rock and roll. That's, That's awesome. right. That's right. That's yeah, right. I, that or makes me panic. happy. It makes me happy to hear that. It's nice to know it's still being done, especially uh, at her level. You know, yeah. I've uh, always obviously. had a lot, a lot of respect for her, and uh, now it's confirmed. Yeah, <laughs> the reasons why. Yeah, she's so, she's uh, she's 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 one of them. You know, hard hardworking people that that deserve to be where she is, you know, and when they, then they say, I mean, you know, not too many people respect the whole hall of fame thing, but she belongs there. She, she does. 
Yeah. Yeah. She she's the type of person that the Hall of Fame should be should be recognizing not not just you know her musical accomplishments but she paved so many roads for so many people and uh and she's still doing it so yeah she uh, amazing person uh and and you wouldn't survive in this business for as long as she has if she didn't have some discipline and some professionalism and that sort of thing that's right yeah, yeah. that's right i mean it, it did help once once we got inducted in, in 2015 you know it did help it, it, it was a big boost um uh, and, uh, it, it, you know, it kept the band on the road and, and, and did, you know, I mean, I, 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 right now I'm no longer touring with her because of health problems, you know, um, and, and I'm, uh, you know, I, I, it's fine talking about it. I had cancer, uh, but the diagnosed with cancer a few years ago. So I had to stop touring, oh. you know, um, but I'm six years cancer free now. And, oh. um, and um, but the last the last major tour I did with her was 2016. We opened up for the Who, um, so that that to me was we had just gotten into the Hall of Fame, and then the following year we did the the we did the Who tour, and that was how I like to remember it. You know, we I went out in that band uh, on top, on top. Yeah, and, man. Wow, that's awesome. And uh, by the way, uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, you're doing better over the past six years. I am. Uh, I am. I'm to, doing really good. If you need yeah. to stay off the road and take care of yourself, then do it. It's more important to yeah. do it now. It gives me more time. I mean, I got. I just finished uh, an, uh, another solo record um, uh, with a guy, a friend of mine, Johnny Rayo, um, in in, in uh, New Jersey, and um, it's all it's all my song, all uh, both our songs. I'm singing everything. I play guitar, um, awesome. some guitar, um, singing, writing, every, wrote everything. And it, we're just trying to get released right now. What's the project called? 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 Phantom. Yeah. What's it called? What's it called? Downtown Phantom. Downtown oh, I like it. Phantom. F Phantom? Downtown Phantom. Phantom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Downtown Phantom. Yeah. Making sure my old ears heard that right. Yeah. Same yeah. Here. So, yeah, there's um, a video. We just did a video for it uh, for the single, and um, so we're just working on it, trying to get a release date, trying to get trying to get some backing with it for it right now. And um, I'm also I'm working on a book. I'm putting a coffee table book. I got talked into doing this thing by my wife and and my business partner Matthew, um, and uh, I got talked into it because of all my drums. I, I got so many drum sets. That um, and, and uh, you know they're piled up, and I got uh, you know I, I since I moved, I had to empty some storage lockers out in New York. So I now I have a, this house, and my garage is filled with all of these drums. <laughs> I bet that I bet that's kind of <laughs> awesome to walk. You need to make like a a uh, 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 haunted garage. Uh, yeah, kind of it's movie insane. about drummers or something. It's it's insane how much I mean, most of them are in flight cases or in big cases, but there's a lot of them out of cases and they're just all over the place. So I got talked into doing this book and it's kind of a, like I'm, we're trying to do this coffee table book where it's I talk about each kit and um, I explain each kit and what tour I use them on and and um, what company because I went through quite a quite a few um, endorsements with company with drum companies. And so, uh, you know, each company made me a couple of drum sets. And so each kit was a little flamboyant, you know, <laughs> yeah. colors and, and naked women on them and stuff like that. And so, uh, um, yeah, so they're, they're all over the place. And so I'm trying to uh, do this book and uh, that's, that's another, kind of a new thing I'm, i've been oh, that's doing a, that sounds yeah. like a, a great project that sounds yeah. fun Stay, so so do you have a website or something where people can catch up with all your latest stuff or i do yeah what's, your website? yeah. what's it called it's, um, just google me and you'll see um all my stuff yeah great all right yeah we just want to let listeners know where they can find your latest projects and that sort of thing um, I want or it's to on um, the downtown Phantom is also on uh, Reverb Nation, too. Okay, all yeah. right. Um, I want 
I wanted to ask you, uh, I'm a, I'm a huge Michael Monroe fan. Yeah. And, uh, am I, did you play in Jerusalem slim with Michael Monroe? I played in, um, yeah, I, I recorded some of that record. I think I recorded most of it. Um, uh, but I did the not faking it at record with oh, Michael. Yeah. 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 I, I have that record. Wow, that's right. That's right. I forgot you were on that one. I got all hung up on the Jerusalem Slim because it's so rare and such an oddity and hard to find. But yeah, I I think at that point um, I was already playing with Joan. I think Steve had, had got, got another drama. But I, I remember doing some recording for that record for the Jerusalem Slim when Michael still lived um, on Third Street in, in, in the East Village. Yeah. Um, but I, I never toured with them or anything. But I do remember doing some work with them, recording work with 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 Steve and and Michael. Yeah. Did you were you uh, were you part of the Demolition Twenty Three project at all? Yes. You were. Did you play on that album? No. No. Okay. No. No. I was around. I, yeah. I dug that. That was a great record. Yeah, that was it cool. Is so underrated. It is so yeah. underrated. It's such a great record. So, what was your involvement with Demolition Twenty Three? Well, I was helping Michael put that whole project together, you know. Okay. Um, but um, once again, <laughs> I was in the, right in the middle of do, working with Joan, so I, I could. There's only so much I could do with, you know, with him. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't really do any gigs or anything because I was too busy. But um, I'd always like get, you know, help him start getting a band together and do some pre-production, and then I'd have to pull out, you know. So it was. There's the beginning of it. Um, yeah, that, that was a great record. I love that record. It's a great record. If it ever actually truly sees the light of day, uh, people are just going to rejoice. Because I know so many people that have burned copies of it and bootleg uh, copies of it because they got to have it. But uh, we we sure would love a proper release. My own copy is a burn that somebody made for me, but I play the heck out of it because it's such a great record. It really was, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you did some studio work uh, with I, I saw on Wikipedia and I, I was doing some homework and there were some names that cropped up that I would have never associated with you with. So I wanted to ask you about a couple of them. And I'll, I'll start with Blue Oyster Cult. I had no idea you were involved in any way, shape or form with Blue Oyster Cult. And so can you tell us a little bit about that time frame? Um, that was probably let's see. Um I had gotten hired from Sandy Perlman um, to do an Albert Bouchard record, the drummer from the cult, from the boys to cult. Um, He had a project going called Imaginos. um, And he hired me, Kenny Aronson, Tom Orangello, a bunch of characters. um, When we went out to the Boogie Boogie Motel in Port Jeff, uh, Long Island. And... um, it was a, a, an ongoing project of Albert, Albert Bouchard and producer uh, Sandy Perlman. And um, we recorded a lot of stuff. It was supposed to be a, a solo record for Albert Bouchard, but it wound up being, uh, a, a, it wound up being a, 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 a Blue Oyster Cult record. Um, I was going to say that title sounds like it. that's under the BOC. T- uh, yes. Model. Yes. Well, now it is. It's a new. It, I. I. I think it's only a few years. I. Th- I think they released it only a few years ago. Mm. The, the Imaginos record. Yeah. Um, but since then, that record was like on the back burner for a long time. So working with Sandy Perlman, um, he had done all the early Blues to Cult records. Yeah. Um. Uh. And and he had so there was a project. I was doing, he hired me for this girl, Joni Paladin. Um, I don't know if she ever did anything, but, and then he hired me to come in and do play on a few songs with, with the, with the band Blois the Cult. And that, that came out somewhere, maybe 89. It was called, the album was Club Ninja. Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, so that was the first Blois the Cult record that I, I oh, that I that you saw my name on, um, and then years later, uh, this Imagino has appeared uh, as not an Albert Bouchard record, but a Blue Oyster Cult record. So 
that's my boys the cold story <laughs> nice wow nice i was just and i'm sticking to it yeah <laughs> No, I was just surprised. Uh, I don't. I don't associate your name with Blue Oyster Cult. But yeah, now yeah, I no, will. Most people w- wouldn't, but it was kind of a, a you know, a, a weird through people, through musicians, kind of. Uh, you know, Albert needed a drummer, and I was friends of a guitar player he hired. You know, it was one of those things. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like the producer hired me because he heard me on. Uh, you know upstairs you know yeah or you heard me on rebel (laughs) yell album or yeah yeah it was nothing like that yeah what's uh what's something that you can tell us and 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 our listeners about what you what made you want to you know what got you hooked on rock and roll what made you want to play drums what's your favorite record tell us a little bit about your your beginnings and and maybe growing up uh you know just as a young person and soaking up what what was soon to be your life? Well, I, you know, my older brother, I had a brother that was really into music and grew up in the 60s and playing records like The Animals, The Stones, uh, Dave Clark Five, mm. um, mostly The Young Rascals. That was my favorite band growing up. You know, the early blue-eyed soul music the righteous brothers the young rascals dave clark like the the songs with the heavy drums that sounded soulful those were the bands i gravitated towards and that's why it was so easy for me to join mink deville when i heard that music it it touched my heart touched my soul and it was easy for me to to fit into that band. I, I just love the way uh, Willie DeVille wrote. He, he wrote these beautiful, you know, love songs. And, and I grew up on the, on R and B music, heavy R and B. And um, that's what I really, I, I want. Dino Dinelli was my favorite drummer from the young rascals. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, where were you born? Where was this? I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. I, I was born in Brooklyn. Grew up in Brooklyn. Um, to, I, I, I stayed. It was in Brooklyn until I was about twelve years old, and then moved out to Staten Island. Okay. In Staten Island, um, I met a whole bunch of great people out there. Great musicians. It's one of they was one of back then in the seventies. Growing up there, it was one of those small towns where kids were really bored. So that. What they do, they listen to Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, and everyone played an instrument out there. Everyone had a garage, and everyone had a band rehearsing in a garage. That's called a and, scene. That's you a know, scene. And, what's that? A scene. Yeah, that was called a scene. You had a scene. The, the oh, Staten yeah. Staten, we, it was the Staten Island Mafia, dude. It was, Love you it. Know, I mean, we had guys like Earl Slick. David oh, Johansson, yes. Yes. Chasm Salton, Sandy Gennaro, Frankie LaRock. I mean, I can go on for a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the people, the musicians that grew up out there in my day. And uh, it's amazing, the people that came off that rock. Wow. And, you know, it's it's truly amazing. And and I'm proud to say that I was one of them. Uh, no, I was- it, was a, it was a time in my life that I, that I, that I loved. It was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, thank you for sharing that. You know, I was going to say it in our intro, but I'll say it now. It's been an honor to have you on our show because of the, ba- I mean, I'm, I'm learning every, you know, every other sentence you, you say, I, I'm <laughs> learning something about you and, and about rock and roll, you know, um, the fact that you, you know, all, you can think about New York and, and, uh, you know, the whole, the whole coast, but specific to, like you said, the rock and the island and, and uh, the people coming out of there and just, you know, electric lady and the whole, everything you were, this is, this is my point. You were part of a movement that set the standard for, for generations. You were part of it. So 
my sir well, it is an honor to meet you and and work with you today well thank you so yeah. much jason thank you yeah. so much for having me and um and you know you know when it when you're having a good time when the time goes by so quick yeah and, and I, I, uh, I want to get one more question in before we before we cut you loose because I know you got you're you're on family vacation and you've been generous enough to step away and hide in a peaceful corner to do this show, <laughs> but um, I I I got to ask because you've been on so many great albums, timeless classic albums, and you've played with so many big names. As a as a drummer, which album do you look back on and and call your finest performance? Oh, that's hard to say. Uh, I, you know, the the it, I I go through moods sometimes uh, where I'll play um, a Roger Daltrey album I played on, or or it's, or or a uh, you know Fats Deacon record. You know, something uh, you know that I know that you normally don't hear quite often, but it just brings brings me back and like, wow, I forgot how cool that record was that I, you know, what I did on that record. And, you know, I got to remember to do that beat again, or, or, you know, what I did on that Mink DeVille song, that ballad, I forgot about that. I got to use that again. And so I, I can't, I can't pinpoint one record. This, I just, I, I, I think I, I, I left my mark on a lot of them and it's definitely my mark, you know, it's me playing on them records. You know, I, I think, you know, as much as I am, I know I'm a very solid, simple, very simple drummer. Not, I don't do anything flashy. I don't do anything, um, you know, um, uh, that any other drummer couldn't do. But I know where to do it and when to do it. And I think that's the most important thing with, with a drummer. Definitely. Yeah. You mentioned You're Roger playing. Daltrey. That's that's amazing. That was, and that, I shit myself. You said I played well, <laughs> yeah. I If you need to excuse yourself, that's fine. <laughs> that Roger Daltrey record. Yeah, that's probably one of them. What? Yeah, that, yeah. And then yeah. another another name I was going to bring up that I wanted to mention. You you played with uh, Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones. We did. Uh, yeah. What, what did you do? What album did you do with him? It wasn't really an album. It was kind of j- j- like Hit Factory tapes that. That he never, I don't even think he ever released them, but it was one night that turned into a week. <laughs> oh, <Uh-oh. laughs> as things are likely to do with Ronnie Wood. One of those. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I think I think maybe Steve Stevens was involved, and and a, a cast of characters that I won't even go into. It was it was one of those crazy scenes, you know that we did, and they they everything now wound up on tape i just don't know what happened to it you know yeah. i just like to add ronnie's ronnie's name to my to my uh, uh catalog because i had so much fun with him man sure. you know and he became well, a friend of mine that whenever he'd come through new york you know we'd always hang out have a have a beer or something or you know go and have dinner with our wives together and uh he wound up being a a, a friend just from hanging out and recording the session, you know, that's amazing. Cool. That's amazing. That is amazing. And I, I also wanted to let people know, uh, I think Matt, Matt told me that you're uh, currently finishing up the, a new album from Wanda Jackson. Is that right? It's done already. Yeah. It's all, oh. it's out. I think it's out already. Yeah. Okay. It just, I think it just came out last week. Okay. Yeah. So people need to look for that as well. And, yeah. uh, and and I'm sorry. One more, I got to ask you about Batusis. This is uh, Sylvain Sylvain and Cheetah Chrome. Were you part of that recording, or or did you I tour? Did the, I did the Batusis record. Yeah, you did the record. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I yeah. couldn't remember if it was you or Les Les Warner did the record. No, it was no, you. Les Warner did the did the tour. I think. Yeah. I think okay. he did the tour with the Batusis. But uh, yeah, I I we we recorded that record in Nashville. What did, uh, what was it like working with Syl- Sylvain and uh, and oh. Chrome? Both a couple of characters because I've I've been lucky enough to spend some time with them um, because one of my buddies played in both of their bands and so they were they were in Austin, you know, here and there and uh, I'd go spend a little bit of time and hang out. So, um, well, Cheetah and I, Cheetah and I worked together on a couple of Ronnie Spector records. Um, in the early 80s. Oh, it just gets so, better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Sorry, we're <laughs> laughing, Tommy. It's just, this yeah. is great, man. One this thing is leads great. To another, and we keep hearing these. What? It's like, <laughs> yeah. Carry on. Sorry. So you worked yeah. with Tony Specter. Yeah, well, I, I think it was. Uh, I think Genya Genya Raven was producing. Um, I think it was Siren, a record called Siren, um, Ronnie Spector, and and Cheater and I got hired to do some work on it. Um, that was the first time I worked with him. Uh, later on, uh, he had borrowed the Blackhearts band, me, Dougie, and Enzo, to do an East Coast. Uh, he he had he didn't have a band. He wanted to do some Dead Boys songs, and so he got he booked like about I don't know five or six shows up and up you know up and down the East Coast, uh, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, you know, bunch of gigs. Uh, we had great fun. It was the four of us. It was Jones Band, the Blackhearts, with Cheetah Chrome. Basically, that was it. Wow. And um, that was only a few years ago. We did that. And then, and then, and then later on, he, he called me to come and record. He said that he had um, uh, written some song, or oh, he didn't have written. He, we actually still most mostly came up with them songs in the studio. We that was, those Batusi songs were like a jam. Yeah, what, was it, whatever was on those records, we went in. They kind of have it, had an outline of some songs. I, you know. And they just said, let's bang these out. We went into a recording studio and and uh, they kind of wrote them songs. Them songs wrote themselves. Those Batusi songs. Happens. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. It was so cool. Sill was just one of these guys, man, that anything he touches, he made sound beautiful. He was just a special dude. dude. And, you know, he, he just he added something really unique to any project he got involved with. To be clear, um, Phil Sylvain, 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 Phil Sylvain, yeah, Phil, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was uh, he spent some time here in Austin because one of our friends uh, was our, our actually um, a few of our friends were hired as his backing band, and so mm. they would rehearse here in Austin, and they would be sort of based out of Austin. So um, I, I got to spend some time with with Sylvain and Cheetah, and uh, Sylvain really was. He's just one of those people you use the word sweetheart, and I don't even know if that does him justice because he was just a really, just he a is. fun, fun spirited, cool person to be around, and obviously talented in many ways. I mean, the the, so the guitar talented. playing, the hats, and everything, you know. So talented, yeah, so talented, yeah. Man. It, you know, and of, and ahead of his time, when he, you know, I mean, he was the New York Dolls. It was all sell. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, it was his. That was his baby, that band. That, that was his, that came out of his mind, out of, out of his heart. Yeah. You know, um, all them songs and everything, those were all his. And um, anything he got involved with, he was just, he, you know, he made it special. He, he was a special person. Yeah. And uh, he was yeah. a cool guy to be around. And I loved hanging out with him, he, you know. And, and I, I hated to see him and him leave like he did you know yeah yeah well he left a lot of people with a lot of fond memories and a lot of great yeah. music so he's he's got that going for him we end and up, uh, yeah. so, we end so up have you about. um it's been an honor having you um i think we should let you get back to your family since you're on vacation I was today. say real quick we end up talking about sylvain quite a bit on the, yeah he does his name comes up yeah. a lot in the like show every, um, every third episode or something and it's not because we've got him written down on our notes his no. influence just kind of weaves throughout the conversation of rock and roll and somebody knows well he was. touched so many lives lives in so many ways he's exactly. and he's worked with a lot of people yeah you know, exactly. uh, whether it's writing with them or you know writing for them or people covering his songs you know he, he in one way or another he his name will always come up yeah yeah, yeah. that's the mark of a great person right yeah. there Sure is. Well, yeah. Tommy, uh, I can't thank you enough. It's really been an honor. We we we've been really lucky with some of the guests we get on this show, uh, but today was a really special one for me because I remember seeing you on MTV when I was a kid, and you've had a long illustrious career. And we didn't we barely scratched the surface today, but what you were able to share with us was just great. I enjoyed it. So well, I had a great time. time, man. Both of you guys uh, were were great, 
And, um, you, you know, um, uh, you got, you, you have my number and you can get in touch with me and we could do this again whenever you want. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for well, that. We might, we, me and Dave might take a trip to San Antonio and call you and meet you at the top. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Something. Cool. So we'll yeah, get together for fun. beer and tacos. Yeah. Cool beans. Great. Yeah. All right, Tommy, we'll let you go. Um, I'm Metal Dave. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, we thank you for listening to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. And we thank our special guest, Tommy Price, for joining us today. Thank you all for listening. And thank you, Tommy. Cheers, guys. 